This is WCN. The Whole Care Network. You talk. We listen. Content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the Whole Care Network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice, and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Remember to have compassion and kindness because there are injuries and disabilities that you that we might not be able to see. We all have our stories, and by sharing them, we can truly show the power of the human spirit. Hello, my name is Jody O'Donnell Ames. Welcome to another episode of Gratitude to Latitude, Stories of Resilience and Hope. My guest today is a Reiki master, intuitive healer, motivational speaker, She is Grounded Illumination. Her name is Felice Nussbaum Martino, And welcome to the show, Felice. Thank you, Jody. I'm so happy to be here with you. Well, I am grateful. And this topic is something um, that speaks to me. And this season of my podcast, I'm interviewing people with incredible stories, many of which are new to our audience. And this um, particular incident that has happened to you and everything that has unfolded is just something that I have not been able to address yet on air. So I'm grateful to have you as a guest. And I always begin about the beginning of your childhood, an experience that happened in your childhood. So when I read about you on your website, you mentioned knowing, and I have said that about myself, that as a child, I felt this sense of knowing that something was either I would, this awareness, this empathy, this insight was at a higher cal- caliber than other children my age. What did, what did that mean to you? And, and give me an example of that. So I, like you, I, from a very young age, I remember feeling that I was a little different maybe, or I could feel things and I felt people's emotions and I felt the depth that existed inside. And it just, it felt like going through life, there was something more, there was some distant remembering of something that I couldn't quite put my finger on that, that it was intangible, really. And I knew you were going to ask this question. So I was thinking about, I was reflecting on experiences when I was younger. And there are a few. And what stood out to me was this particular incident when I was in elementary school, I remember where we were standing. We were at recess and there were two team captains picking kids to be on teams, right? We've we've all been exactly, there. We've all been there. Exactly. <laughs> and I remember standing in the circle and in addition to being self-conscious and self-aware and my own sense of almost the, that duality of good, bad, better, worse, more than, less than. I remember noticing and feeling the kids around me and feeling what others were feeling and feeling that I wanted to get picked. However, if I got picked before someone else got picked, then I would feel bad too. Mm. So it was existing in all of that. And I remember, I don't know if that speaks, answers the question about the knowing, because the knowing was really 
Oh, it, yeah, it does. It, 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 it's there was something core and essential beneath all of that stuff, and beneath all of that that arises out of the the ego and the need to feel safe and feel a sense of belonging. All of that, there was just something greater that I didn't know how to describe it or what it was about. So I went off in search of it. (laughs) I think you hit the nail on the head with that explanation because it's a sense of knowing, as you mentioned, how others feel. And that sense of intuition and empathy really does make you feel differently when you're, especially when you're a younger child and and you're not quite sure how how to describe it and what it means. But I, I can see that example and how it parlays into who you are now, which brings me to a spiritual, profound experience that you had. I read about it on your website, which is groundedillumination.com. There was a horrific accident, and I'm just going to read part of that description And then I'll allow you to explain it. And then I have lots of questions for you because this is something, you know, I read the book by Ed Alexander, Proof of Heaven, years ago, who was, I believe, a neuroscientist who just didn't believe in life after death, God, spirituality, Mm -hmm. anything. And then that experience changed his life. So I can't wait to get to that. But let me just read just a snippet from your website. I was high above, looking down upon the scene with the bird's eye view. My body lay motionless and looked like that of a chalk drawing. So you're talking about what a date, (laughs) when I was in college, a date told me that he had an out-of-body experience. I was a sophomore, he was a sophomore, and we were out on a date (laughs) having dinner and he just said it. I hadn't have had an outer body experience and I was sleeping and looked down and there I was. So please share the experience that led to this ultimate level of understanding, the greatest intuition of all. When you say the experience, the experience of what happened in that accident, what led up to the accident, which part just to... Yeah, the, the whole experience that took place. So I had been a Montessori teacher and an educational consultant in my before, right? Sometimes there are, there are markers. Right. And right. I know what that is, Montessori. The, the before and the after sometimes, right? And, and how we adapt. So, so I had left work one day and I was walking to my car, which was parked off campus in a lot that the school rented. And I came to a light. And it was an intersection, a busy intersection. And I waited for the light to turn red, giving me the the right of way. I looked both ways. The cars had stopped. And up from behind me came, it, it turned out to be a large pickup truck. And it came up from behind me, so I never saw it. And it made a left hand turn and going about 30 miles an hour. And hit the right side of my body and propelled me 30 feet in the air and about 35 feet from the crosswalk. And on impact, I don't really know if it was on impact or not. You know, I mean, I've done a lot of looking into trauma and different states that the body goes into, right? So so I left my body and I looked down upon the scene. And which is what I just read. And I saw the entire scene below me with a vision that wasn't based in my eyes, right? Because I was lying with kind of my knees bentish, looking to the left. So I could not have seen that with my eyes. And I saw it in this kind of three dimensional bird's eye view all around me, kind of like a spotlight on what was happening below. And the panic-stricken people that had gotten out of their cars. And I heard what was going on. Again, not with my sense of hearing, but from 
from this understanding, this hearing in a holographic way almost. It's it's hard to give language to these experiences that we don't always have language for. And then that scene faded. There was almost like an assessing the scene and it happened so suddenly. So there was this, from this momentary dis. I don't want to say discomfort because I wasn't feeling anything in my body. It was more of a being startled and trying to make some kind of sense of things somewhere in my consciousness. And then there was pure peace and pure comfort. And I was somewhere else entirely. And as I share, I don't know whether that emerged or whether I traveled there. It was a completely another environment that my consciousness was in. So I'm happy. So I want to mm-hmm. stop. Yeah, I just want to stop you there for a second because, wow. So there are, you know, as I did research, and I've, I've researched this since college, since that experience, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people who describe near-death experiences. There are dozens and dozens of books that relive the incident in which they experienced that. And you described similar words, peaceful, this bird's eye view, looking down. And in my mind, I'm fascinated by the fact that it's similar every single time. You know, in my mind, it's just another reason to and a level of understanding to explore other possibilities outside of this realm. What's interesting is, yeah. You know, life after death. What's interesting is, and that death is an extension in another way of, in in my belief and my understanding and my experience, that it's a different form, like that we exist beyond our breathing form when we are embodied as a human. And up until that point, I had had out-of-body experiences through meditation, through spiritual pursuits, through the use of plant medicine many, 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 many years ago in my early 20s. And this was different. This was almost, this was a cracking open to all of it that allowed me to access that knowing that there was something more that I always felt as a child to experience that, to to really ingrain it in every aspect of my knowing and of my remembrance. I don't know if that's too... Kind of like a... Yeah, it was kind of like a confirmation. Absolutely. What you felt as a child coming, you know, coming to fruition and confirming those feelings. Absolutely. And, you know, that that has become my happy place. I can access these uh, places now through meditation and through other places. It's the key is, and when I lived in an ashram, this was also the, you know, living in the ashram is gets to be, once you develop certain habits, and routines, that gets to be the easy part. It's taking that out and embodying that and being that in the world, in everyday life. And that's my experience with this, to how do you take the spiritual gleanings and insights and understandings and be in a human body? You know, there's a saying and be right, normal. Right, and be relatable. I mean, there's there's a saying about that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And what I am going to, I've expanded upon that to say we are both spiritual beings having a human experience and human beings having a human experience. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. Because, you know, there are real, we are biologically and physiologically wired as human beings for trauma, for pain, for joy, for resilience, for all of it, right? And to negate any one aspect of that 
can lead us into mm. toxic positivity. And it's kind of being in the both end experience, right? So having embodied spiritual practices that we can access a place inside of us that's connected to something greater that we're all connected to and having tools to get there while we're here and be individual expressions of that that place. So it's kind of like enlightenment with awareness. Mm-hmm. With embodied awareness. In, yeah. in many ways, aw- embodied awareness so that you can coexist with others. That's a lot to think about and powerful stuff. And I want to go back to, you know, so you've had this horrific Mm -hmm. accident where you are thrown in the air, lying there. What was the recovery like (laughs) for that? So we, we know that you had this, we know that you had this experience and I want to talk more about that as well as your, your life in at the ashram, but what, how does one recover from that? And how do you, how do you get from where you are to where you need to be? Hmm. Well, there, I'm still in certain therapies. There is fractures. I fractured my sacrum. I fractured my pelvis. I had internal organ damage inside. There was internal bleeding. I sprained all the right side of my body. And there were multiple bones in the pelvic and sacral area that were fractured. I had staples in my head. I mean, it was a long, you know, spiritually, it was great. I mean, I feel blessed to have had that experience and the physical recovery and the emotional recovery and the mental strength has, that's been a road, right? Not driving for a year and a half and having to learn to work with my brain as it functions now without feeling limited and speaking a story into it, right? It's such a balance. So It's been a long road and my identity shift, you know, there's something about identity that at the core, who we are never changes, yet how we identify ourselves, the roles we play as what we do for work, that's what has, that's what shifted. So really leaning into that core identity. So there was a lot of different modalities that I've tried and that I've worked with and that I've moved through and trainings and coaching and both allopathic and traditional and non-traditional that has allowed me to be at a place where I can now express, where I can now express the gifts of the experience in a way that could perhaps be helpful for someone. You know, I, I've always looked at things as, whether we believe that something happens to us or for us, not getting into that road, it's more stepping into the choice of asking the question, how is this for me, right? And knowing that if this experience can help or impact or inspire or serve or comfort or support anyone, it gives it more meaning and value, right? And I see the specific ways why it was for me Uh, personally, but using it in service. Yeah. Absolutely. And I really appreciate the fact that you said that you you really attacked your recovery with Mm -hmm. body, mind, spirit, because that's that is addressing the whole person. And this is, you know, when you go through trauma, it affects all aspects of your being. So if you, you can't just recover physically. Right. And you can't mind or you can't mindset your way out of it. Right. You can't like all the positive thinking in the world and all the positive affirmations and all of that. It's I've worked with a somatic experience therapist and done EMDR and done practices that allow me to really feel the grief and the being in the both end. Right. It's yes, here is there is this elated spiritual experience and also the body keeps the score and the trauma and the places of holding and how that manifests in subconscious ways and unraveling all of that. So yeah, all of it. Did you live at the ashram before or after the incident? Many, many, many years before, many years before, but yeah. And and what drove you to do that? <laughs> well, 
I, after, you know, that, that inner nudging of the knowing that there was more, right. Mm -hmm. That, uh, that Mm -hmm. I, I grew up in a certain way and I'm so grateful for my upbringing and for the family that I grew up in. And it was a tight knit community with overarching values. And my parents instilled some other values and additional values in us. And I had this need to explore, to be in search of what is this something more, which led me down this spiritual path. So I graduated from college, I went to NYU, and then I went off and I traveled. And one thing led to the next, led to the next, led to very, uh, quote unquote, out of the box experiences that led me to have these unique interactions. And, um, and I was kind of going with the flow at that time in my life and not taking the prescribed path. And I, through one friend and another friend of my travels in South America, I ended up with a spiritual teacher and she had an ashram in Northern California. And I spent some time there and I also traveled and was with her on the road. I mean, not with her, but there was a group of us that traveled and that was a valuable, a lot of valuable lessons learned through that experience and coming back to the guru that exists within us, right? That we all have access to. It's when we're meditating, when we take the pause to connect in with something deeper, when, when we're in presence, in mindfulness, right? When we're in this place, when we cultivate connection to that place, that is how we can be our own guru and our own teacher and open up to those experiences. Mm. So I love that, Felice. I love that. So so where was the ashram that you actually lived that was in? in? Was that it was in it was California? In San, Mar- San Ramon at Mata Amrita Nanda Mai, otherwise okay. known as Amachi. And you know, at the time there would be 20 of us and Ama in a barn, right? I mean, this was in 1989. It was a long time ago. And I learned, yeah, that was really, but prior to that, you know, when I was at, when I was at NYU, I was a theater major and we had it, we took Tai Chi and I, we were all like, why are we taking Tai Chi? What, what does this have to do with anything? And I remember the day and the moment and where I was when something clicked. I was like, oh, Mm. this has to do with that knowing, with that something more, with some kind of energy that's in me and bigger than me and in everyone. And that was also a pivotal moment for me that influenced my journey. So all of these paths have led you to this Mm -hmm. moment. I would say so. From the time you were little. Yeah, it's... Which is incredible. Yeah, and it's funny, you know, when we look at our lives and look at the things that happen, we wouldn't have necessarily chosen, you know, some situations and some of discomfort and some of uh, stepping outside of our comfort zone. Some of that is... It, we find ourselves in circumstances or things happen around us or it's not necessarily consciously chosen. And other times we consciously choose to step out of our comfort zone. And I think the more we can choose right. that, the more it prepares us for those times when we haven't consciously chosen it, when we find ourselves in the midst of of coming up against it or challenges or adversity, right? Like it prepares us. And this culture that we live in, this time, everything that we do, everything that is being invented and created is to make us more comfortable. Everything, you know, more convenient, more comfortable, warmer, you know, softer, everything. And I made this uh, the simple analogy this morning about it with a client of mine. You know, I'm a coach. We were talking about diet and how to change your eating habits. And I'm like, well, one, one simple example is a cup of coffee, right? If you have a cup of coffee that's, that you have is black and you're used to that, you're used to it. 
if you add cream and sugar, <laughs> you're used to cream and sugar. And going from cream and sugar back to black is going to be a challenge because you're getting, you get comfortable very quickly. We humans get comfortable very quickly with the perks of life, you know? So putting yourself outside of that comfort zone, taking cold showers, putting yourself in the woods hiking. And even if you know, you're out of breath and it's tiring, put yourself in those situations so that you can build your resilience. And that's a part of this conversation. So obviously in your recovery, you did that every single day. And I know it took you quite some time. One of the common responses to a near-death experience is a public opinion, Mm -hmm. right? People are like, did that really happen? Well, there's a scientific um, reason why it happened. You know, it goes on and on and on. Did it, how did people respond to your explanation of what happened when you had that near-death experience? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. For a while, I didn't share it and I didn't really read about it. I didn't want to be influenced by anyone else's experience or how anyone described it. And I will say that when I I was in rehab for a bit and then I had visiting nurses in my house for many months. And when I was in rehab, I did see this woman. I I mean, this is a long answer. Is that okay? All right. Great. Sure. So, So I saw this woman... And she was talking on the Dr. Oz show and she was describing an experience she had. I mean, my attention span at that time was not, I could barely speak and think or lift a fork to my mouth. Like I, it was just a blip of hearing a woman describe a place that she was in and her description of it was this. You have your your hand. Imagine your hand is out and the fingers are each separate coming out of your palm. They're all separate, yet they're all connected because they all go into the palm. They're all connected to your palm, even though they're separate fingers. And she was describing this. And I remember feeling like, oh, that's what happened to me. You know, I didn't quite know how to make sense. I was still into grading what had just happened. And I sat with that and I didn't listen to anyone else. It turns out that that was Anita Marjani who wrote a book called What If This Is Heaven, I believe. And then she wrote another book. And whatever people will say, well, were you pronounced legally dead? Were you whatever, however it lands for people, it lands for people. This was simply my experience Mm -hmm. And it is affirming now to hear people overlapping now that I've gotten out more and spoke up about it and not worried about if people are going to look at me like I have 16 heads or not. It's kind of that's none of my business. Uh, It's incumbent upon me to, and the guidance was to share from my experience and whatever is in people's listening is in people's listening and not to take that personally. And it feels important that now, especially in these last year and a half, where we have come face to face with our own mortality and fear around that and the people not necessarily wanting to have the the conversation about that, all I can do if people are interested is share my experience and it will land for others however it lands. Does that, is that helpful? It makes complete sense. It's like anything else, you know, you know, you're being authentic and sharing what happened to you and people can utilize that information however they exactly, so choose. Exactly, exactly. It's definitely, for me, I, it, there's no fear for me around about passing over. There's no not that I want that to happen. I mean, there there are things that I feel I'm called to do to feel complete here. And, you know, I, I recently did my certification in hospice Reiki so that I can be mm. a volunteer in service in that capacity to be supportive of people as they transition. And I, I have found that that generally people find that very comforting. People find 
my experience comforting. I haven't found too many, I haven't come across too many people that are outwardly skeptical and the people will ask thought-filled questions or make, you know, I've done several interviews and I've read some of the comments and people have their own opinions and comments. You know, everyone is where they're at and their own understanding and, and what it, it, I'm just off. I'm just sharing the experience that happened. Right. Right. Will you share that experience with your hospice Reiki clients? Or will that not really be a part of the process because you'll be exactly. doing Exactly. That's, that's, yeah, it's more about a space that I access and move into when I'm allowing the Reiki to flow I, through. I was just going yeah, to say. It's, it doesn't, if someone so, knows about it and has questions about it, but I will not initiate it. Mm-hmm. I don't, it, it's like, it has to feel appropriate. Right. And I don't. I'm a massage yeah. practitioner. I understand yeah. completely. So. Right. You will utilize that experience in giving treatment to Reiki to people who are on hospice. You will utilize your experience Correct. in your own way. It won't be something that's shared. It's right kind of away. integrated into so who I, I am now and how I walk in the world. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's the whole thing about grounded illumination, how to, how to take these aha moments. And we all have them, right? These moments of these epiphanies or of these highly attuned understandings or intuition, how do we take those things and ground them in an embodied expression, right? And to me, it's, it's about service and about, about being the change we want to see, whatever that change looks like, being the change we wish to see in the world. And helping others access that place inside if they so wish to do so. So this is about stories of resilience and hope. And when we, when we share those experiences in ser- through service, then we are creating hope. And that's exactly yeah. right. And I love, I love that title, Grounded Thank Illumination. You, Jody. I, I knew prior to the accident, there's a bunch of things that happened in a very short period of time. And up until that point, I didn't really have the tools, the resiliency tools. I mean, I was like thrown into it head on in a short period of time. And what kept me going in addition to gratitude and small blessings at the time, it was, oh, someone smiled at me in the supermarket line. Oh, I had the opportunity to pick something up for someone. The smallest little things that would get me out of this dark period and this dark spinny place and the knowing and the feeling that if this experience could help one person, again, it makes it worth it. And that was in the early days before the accident happened. As we um, come to our close in our, in this riveting conversation. I'll, I'll, I'll have you go back to that. But what I wanted to share is that I had a dear friend who suffered traumatic brain injury. Um, he was hit by a car. He survived as well, had a year and a half recovering recovery in Philadelphia. 60, as far as 2019, 61,000 people suffered from TBI. Share what you were going to say. And then I'm going to ask you if you have a book mm. to recommend um, for people to learn more about TBI. So, so what I was going to say is just to, to offer is when we're cultivating resiliency and we're cultivating that that grit, there's a grace aspect to it and and giving ourselves grace so that as we're trying to make change, as we're maybe wanting to go from the cream and sugar in our coffee to black coffee, right? To every night or throughout the day, giving yourselves, I call them hallelujah moments, where you give yourself a pat on the back Mm -hmm. for what might seem small, yet it's an accomplishment. It's a stepping outside of your comfort zone. It's a you know, maybe you got up and you took a five minute walk when you really didn't want to take a five minute walk, whatever it is. And that 
builds this confidence and that builds the ability to know that we can do hard things. So I wanted to share that. Celebrate, celebrating the small moments and great advice. Absolutely. As far as a book about TBI, I don't necessarily have a book about traumatic brain. Actually, I do have a book on my bookshelf that I read. I'd have to go get it right now. So I don't know if you want me to leave and go get it or uh, email it to you. So we can include it in Great. the links to Great. this podcast. I, you know, traumatic brain injury is an invisible injury. In every concussion will affect people differently. There are some similar components and or some different components. Just as I stepped into my new normal, I had a practitioner once said to me, and this is true with most traumatic brain injury survivors, is you'll be back to 100%, but your 100% will look different, right? And for me, I got back there and I did the one thing I didn't want to do and I hit my head this past June and that's a whole nother conversation. But recognizing that invisible injuries are real and and to acknowledge and honor, you never know what the next person next to you is going through and to remember to have compassion and kindness because there are injuries and disabilities that you that we might not be able to see and there are there are so you know the the incidence of tbi and concussion in a lot of data and studies are higher than the number of people that have different types of cancer every year you know i mean it's not um, it's not one against you. i'm just sharing the numbers of people with tbi Right. We don't even think about it. We don't. We don't even think about it. Well, every every podcast, I pick a quote, and I know which quote's going to be chosen for this podcast. Felice, you have been amazing. An amazing guest. Thank you for sharing this incredible story with us. Thank you for the courage. And I know that someone will listen to this and be inspired. Your voice your words will resonate. So thank you so much. And please go to groundedillumination.com to learn more about Felice. Her story is there. Her services are there as well. Thank you and take care. Thank you so much, Jody. Beautiful. Really an honor. This is WCN, the Whole Care Network. You talk, we listen.